Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today as we take a look at uh, Atlantic Canada exploration. Starting the session off, we have Stephen Dean, who was founder, CEO, and chairman of Atlantic Coal, which was sold to St. Barbara in 2019. We thought this would be a great way to start the session because I think a lot of uh, interest came into the region once that transaction happened. Stephen's now uh, founder, CEO, and chairman of Artemis Gold, and he will be walking through that story as well. So thanks for joining us today, Stephen. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, maybe give us a little bit of background on Atlantic Gold and that transaction, and then uh, give us an update on Artemis as well. Sure, happy to, thank you. And, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present some of our experiences in Atlantic Canada. Um, I personally am very fond of Atlantic Canada and it was an honor to have led the development of the Moose River Consolidated Mine. Um, and uh, it continues to, to do well, which is something I'm, I'm very proud of. And of course, I continue to have an involvement with the, uh, the operation there as a director of St. Barbara uh, through to today. Um, and I also want to say that in this presentation, I'm not going to suggest that we know all that we that there is to know or need to know about developing uh, mines in in Atlantic Canada. But I do want to share and happy to share um, our experiences and observations. And 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 also, I think it's fair to say that you know, our experience was in Nova Scotia, but every province within Atlantic Canada is slightly different. So um, some of the things that I am sharing here with you uh, in the context of, of Nova Scotia may not apply to say New Brunswick or Newfoundland or, or elsewhere. Um, and and uh, Deborah, thanks for um, for the introduction. I am going to talk firstly about um, uh, our, some of the observations, challenges, opportunities um, uh, that we saw uh, and and uh, continue to experience, frankly, in some respects. Um, in developing and operating uh, mines in Atlantic Canada, Nova Scotia in particular. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to some of the specifics around our approach at Atlantic Gold and now uh, uh, continuing to apply at, 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 at Artemis. Um, Atlantic Gold was to a large extent a, a bit of a trailblazer in rejuvenating the gold mining industry in Nova Scotia uh, over the last five or seven years. Um, some of the, the challenges and opportunities uh, in our experience in Atlantic Canada would include the following. To start with the challenges. Um, firstly, um, as most of the audience here today would appreciate, uh, you know, the mining business is, is tough enough um, and challenging enough and it's cyclical. So you've got prices that, that, that rise and fall um, and all of those things alone um, make it a challenge to, to build and grow and operate. And mining businesses, gold mining businesses specifically in, 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 in our world. Um, and when you overlay challenges with respect to the clarity around timelines and transparency and, and defined permitting processes, that can make it even more challenging. You know, we've got, we've got in the capital markets, we've got challenges to, to make sure that we stay relevant um, in the capital markets. But in order to get the support that this industry needs, to make significant investments. And, and with those investments come economic development and jobs. And one of my favorite things about building Moose River was that we created 280 jobs, um, direct and indirect jobs um, in, in the Muscadabra Valley where essentially there were no jobs. And because and you're in the, a, a relatively rural, rural area and so you know, the, the governments need job creation outside of the cities. Um, otherwise, everyone's just going to flock to the city and you're going to continue to be challenged by problems with urbanization. So clarity around timelines and permitting processes is really important. And, it, and uh, to the extent that there may be anyone from government listening on, on, on the, to the conference today, 
please, please help us uh, get that clarity. Because as I said, this, this business is, is challenging enough uh, with its own internal challenges, uh, let alone uh, um, the, the, the challenge we have in getting committed long-term investment capital to do what we do. Um, uh, another challenge observation um, is, is it's really, really important to get early engagement um, with with the indigenous nations, um, if two, two, really two things on 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 the social and environmental front. One, um, without support uh, from from in, the indigenous nations in uh, Atlantic Canada or in Canada, period. Um, um, re really, you I, I've got a very difficult job. Of, of developing the mine and uh, the politicians have more, much more courage to back and support the development of mines if you have support through gain through consultation and, and engagement with indigenous nations who are impacted by your project. Um, and then the other important thing is, is, is uh, uh, on the environment front is, is you know, a broad range of science, but in particular water. Water management is, is very important. And um, uh, any, any project, if it's to be a success, needs those two ingredients, support from indigenous nations and good, good environmental science, particularly around water, um, and, and do all of that work upfront and, and, and take it seriously um, and, and get ahead of that curve so that uh, you can make the, the pathway through to, the, to development as straightforward as it can possibly be. Um, just while we're on Indigenous nations, the, the Mi'kmaq nation uh, in Nova Scotia and the Mi'kmaq are um, throughout Atlantic Canada. Um, uh, in Nova Scotia, they are the Mi'kmaq nation is made up of a, a number of different bands who are not always aligned um, within in, the, within their community. So um, early, once again, early engagement and consultation. With with all the indigenous communities, um, not just the you know the over overarching assemblies, but also the individual bands and their chiefs, uh, is really important. And and to get their support early, um, uh, it, it is 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 very important. Now there's 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 further challenges within that in that uh, the, the 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 assemblies and the bands themselves um, have uh, election cycles where where chiefs are elected and and um, and or reappointed or not um, in in two and sometimes four year terms and and that in itself is is, is challenging for from the perspective of continuity but um, to have a broad balance of a pro of support within the indigenous nations is really important turning to some of the opportunities um, there just still isn't enough coordination between the federal and provincial governments, particularly on, on permitting and environmental matters, um, uh, to avoid uh, and mitigate duplication, to streamline that permitting process and provide greater certainty. Um, over here in BC, where I live, um, you know, there is what they call the harmonized process, where um, the, the feds and the province work somewhat together. Um, much more difficult without that and you know for example in Nova Scotia the process in relation to the permitting of the satellite deposits at, um, at Beaver Dam 15 mile stream uh, for example is is much more challenging because of this dual process and um, every encouragement should be made to try and get some coordination and harmonization between the, the two the two governments federally and provincially um, would love to see some of the some of the politicians in government step up with the courage to support the industry, knowing that this industry can deliver jobs and economic development where it matters. Um, and so, to 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 reach out and and frankly, uh, I I've noticed the difference between some of my experience in Atlantic Canada and, and British Columbia, where the provincial government. Uh, is, has been very proactive in, in, in supporting our 
path to construction at the Blackwater project. So the provincial governments, please, please step up and, and, and reach out and support the industry because we, we can deliver things that, uh, that, that the governments need. Um, another opportunity, uh, encourage government investment in geological data, um, which will in turn help companies identify new opportunities. You know, Atlantic Gold's breakthrough was the identification of disseminated gold alongside the typical vein hosts of anticlinal structures that in certain cases um, enhance the economics. Um, if that was something that Atlantic Gold identified and dis discovered, but if governments can help companies and, and the exploration teams with government uh, funded geological data to help us get uh, along that path, um, that, that's, a, that's a huge, huge benefit. And, and I know Nova Scotia is doing that um, and doing that well. Um, other opportunities, initiatives that, that bring together provincial, local and indigenous nations governments together uh, for communication and coordination. Um, I give an example, the, the, the BC Pathway to Collaboration uh, is an initiative under the Indigenous Government Summit um, and uh, to work, working with the provincial and, and other local governments to make sure that everyone's working together for supported projects. Would love to see more of that in Atlantic Canada. Um, they are sort of some of the, as I said, opportunities and challenges that, that, that we experienced and, and still see in many respects uh, in, in Nova Scotia specifically, but probably Atlantic uh, Canada generally. Um, I'm going to move on now to what we in Atlantic Gold and and still today in, in Artemis call our differentiators. And I think every company should have a series of differentiators which differentiate you from your peers um, and, and, and make you stand out as, as, a, as a, a place to put capital. Um, and, and also um, help de-risk the, the project development phase of, of, of uh, your company and, and to create the best opportunity for successful development. One of our differentiators at Atlantic Gold and at Artemis uh, is what we call insider capital. Um, what that is, is that we, we, we brought our, our own capital to bear in developing and building Atlantic. Uh, and that was absolutely critical because frankly, during that period between 2014 and up to really 2018, 2019, the, the, the capital markets were more or less closed for uh, junior gold companies. Even today, with the gold price a little higher, and you know, there's there's a bit more um, kick in the step of the industry. Um, it's still very very difficult for junior companies to raise capital. So, my my recommendation to to any company um, and or investors is is to partner with long term committed capital way in if you can, um, because that will get you through the, the ups and downs of the cycle. Um, and, and that will give you an ability to, 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 to chart a course and continue on that course uh, despite the noise that might be occurring in, in, in the capital markets at the same time. Um, and then with that capital, um, be careful to stage it. You don't need to build the biggest and shiniest uh, um, mine uh, or deposit um, right at the outset. Um, we, as everyone knows, stage first the development of the two coir deposit and, and then the next steps, uh, the, the Beaver Dam and 15 Mile Stream and then ultimately the Cochrane Hill deposit. Um, but if, you're, if you manage to get your initial capital uh, to get into business, to, to get into operation and cash flow, uh, down to as, as, as small a number, number as you possibly can, and then use that operating cash flow to both explore and or to, to expand the business um, is always going to be a good outcome for you um, and, and a good outcome in terms of returns on capital and attracting uh, both valuation and other investors to, to, to your plan um, because of that discipline. Talking about discipline, one of the other challenges with, with our industry over the last 
two or three decades, but in, in particular us after over the last 10 or 15 years, has been um, um, uh, in, in development assets, capital overruns and schedule overruns. Uh, if you ask most veteran investors, institutional investors in, in this sector, that's, that's one of the criticisms that they will level at us. So one of the ways we uh, at Atlantic Gold and at Artemis today um, seek to deal with that is, is and it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a steal from the Aussie playbook, is to apply a, a concept of fixed price contracts for construction of, the, of uh, large components of, of the development. And what that does is it, it shifts the risk, the execution risk from us, the company and our shareholders to the contractor and, and aligns their objectives with ours. And, and because their balance sheet is therefore at risk, and you know, you've got to make sure it's supported by a very robust contract. And, and the secret to that, to, to that approach is up, putting a lot of work up front in developing that, uh, uh, that, that, that EPC contract and then and the detailed engineering that goes with it uh, way up front before you even start uh, the site preparation for, for a development. Um, and and supporting that commitment from the contractor needs to be a bunch of of, of very robust uh, contract provisions, but most importantly, um, performance security in the form of letters of credit or performance bonds, which mean that in the event that there is a default or a failure by the contractor, then you can immediately access that capital and get it back on track. So managing and mitigating the risk around um, uh, construction, uh, are both in terms of budget as well as in, in timeline is really important. Um, Use a little bit of conservative debt once you've got a robust project. Don't be afraid to use some debt um, to, to bring the capital to bear to build, build the project. Um, as I emphasize conservative and structural well in a normal sort of bank, bank style uh, basis. Um, because what it does is, and particularly in this environment where interest rates are you know, at record lows, um, it, it, it blends the cost of your capital. Your equity capital is really expensive, particularly if you're trading at a discount to your NAV. So, so your, your cost of equity capital is very, very high. And if you can, you can negate that dilution effect and, you, and if you can offset some of the high cost of capital with some lower cost capital debt within prudent structure is, is, is a good plan. And we use that to, to, to good effect in Atlantic. Um, De-risk as much as you can your resource um, and, and your, your deposit before you start mining. Now, Atlantic Gold, uh, I think, is famous for uh, kicking off what we call our grade control program. Uh, now, this is an open pit deposit. It's much more challenging, but not impossible uh, on, a, on, a, on a lesser scale with underground deposits, but with an open pit deposit. Don't be afraid to look at uh, grade control drilling before you start to get into production, because that, what, what that gives you is an increased level of confidence because, because what you're doing is getting up to 15, 20 times more density of data than your proven reserve. And when in the first year or two, and that's where you should focus initially, in your first year or two where your risks are greatest in, in terms of economics and startup, um, it gives you a much better gauge on the tons and gray that you're gonna to deliver to the mill in that critical first year or so of, of, of startup. And then keep that program going uh, to, maintain, uh, uh, to, to maintain that knowledge base as you ro roll forward. Um, and then finally, um, keep an eye towards um, uh, expiration upside. Um, why are you de-risking and, and going through the construction phase? And this slide here, thanks for putting up the, the deck, um, um, is, is a, a good example of that progressive de-risking process. Um, each one of those milestones from 2014 through to 2019 um, are, were critical in de-risking and progressing and executing the project, ranging from EPC contracts, fixed price, um, commencing construction, getting project debt, so the project was then funded, uh, commissioning, commercial production, 
and then, then and then during that same period uh, in the in the latter part of 2018 and, and 19 was the discovery and drilling out of the other deposits. Uh, over that period, we achieved a uh, more time more than 11x return, 1129% uh, return to be precise, from inception idea to to ultimate sale to St. Barbara uh, in 2019 during a period when the GDXJ, the, the gold index, junior gold index was down 29%. So that step-by-step -step systematic de-risking is really important. Um, and next slide, if we, if we um, uh, go to the, 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 uh, move on to the Artemis story, um, we're doing exactly the same thing. Um, focusing for the next little while on our EPC contracts, getting our project debt in place, getting government permitting and sign off are all critical milestones to triggering and surfacing value in a systematic and disciplined way towards operations and, and, uh, and, and commercial production. Next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about Artemis, uh, if, if we may. I know we're over here in BC and not in, in Atlantic Gold, but some of, the, some, of the, uh, uh, some of these points may be relevant. Um, uh, Artemis owns today, Artemis was a Spinco out, out of Atlantic Gold just prior to the sale, um, as part of the sale process to St. Barbara. And uh, we were targeting um, a, a, another development project where we could apply the same differentiators, the same playbook that I just walked through then to, um, to, uh, to, to the Blackwater asset here in BC. Um, Blackwater is a, is a massive deposit. It's uh, 12 million ounces in, in, uh, in total resources, um, 8 million ounces in reserves. Uh, that makes it about 16 times bigger in terms of reserves than, than the Tukway mine when we kicked off Atlantic Gold. So well, th this time we're, we're really leveraging, hopefully, some of these um, differentiators that I just touched on. We have an after-tax MPV at Blackwater of about 2.2 billion, which is about 18 to 20 dollars a share uh, today um, versus our stock price of about five and a half dollars today um, uh, and a payback of uh, two years and an IRR with project debt of around 50, 55, 0, 50% of 1,540 gold. Um, um, lots of leverage to that, to that reserve um, with um, uh, the gold price going up and or down. Um, uh, good news is when it goes up, it's uh, that MPV increases by about 50%. Um, and uh, we still have a very robust um, uh, project uh, at a $1,300 gold price uh, with a 38% IRR and a $1.5 billion um, uh, uh, NPV, which equates to about twelve or thirteen dollar a share, um, which so you know, all things going well, that would be an easy double from from today's stock price. Next slide. This is the the, the, the next slide will show you the staging once again that I talked about uh, in in our in our business philosophy and approach that we applied to both Atlantic and now applying to Artemis. Phase one, phase two, and phase three are the three expansion phases. We're starting off small. Minimizing that capital, and um, and and then using that operating cash flow to then fund the expansion capital and also the ex exploration. I'm going to talk about in a moment with that operating cash flow. But the key is to get into into production. In this case, um, in the first phase for the first five years, we produced about 250 thousand ounces um, at low low cash costs of of, of around the the 500 uh, US an ounce all in sustaining cash costs um, uh, because of uh, a nice high grade cap to this deposit um, at, at, at Blackwater. And then as, as the, the, the scale of the operation gets bigger, we match that with a lower cutoff and then we're mining more gold. Um, we anticipate that the, this mine life um, uh, and phase four, where, we, where, where we're just treating stockpiles, will be pushed out to the right, um, um, way beyond uh, 18, years 18 to 23. We expect that the phase three will continue on for the reasons that I'm about to ex explain on the next slide. And that's to do with the fact that we see some resource conversion and some extension of the deposit. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a picture of, of the Blackwater deposit in, in, uh, in, 
in section. This is the resource block model in the gold blocks. They have 10 by 10 by 10 blocks. And as you can see, the, the mineralization plunges north, northwest through the PFS 1400 US gold pit design. And, and the, we are bounded only by information that those gold blocks are informed by drilling. And that's where the drilling finishes uh, in that plunging north, northwest zone. And then on the, on the other side, on the right hand side, you see it plunging through the southern pit wall uh, on, uh, rather vertically. And uh, we're, we're planning to put some holes in that during this de development phase to, the, to one of our playbook points that I made earlier, keep testing and growing your deposit uh, as, as much as, as, as possible uh, while and creating that news while you're building the project. The other, the other important thing that, that, that can come with large deposits, next slide please, uh, is depicted in this in this slide. This is the the, the purple outline is the PFS um, uh, pit limit of the PFS design at fourteen hundred gold. If you rerun that, that same model with the same resource block model without drilling a single additional hole, um, and run that model at two thousand dollar pit shell, you add all of those red blocks that sit below the current purple um, surface that is the current pit, pit design shell. And just that, how significant that is, is captivated, captured in this uh, table on the left, where uh, we, we show that total measured and indicated without a further drill hole increases by 3.73 million ounces from the eight million ounce deposit. That's almost a 50% increase in potential uh, reserve ounces. So um, the big deposits get bigger. And, and, and so while, we, while you're building your, your deposits, make sure you, you're still adding value by adding additional ounces. Next slide, please. And I'm about to wrap it up shortly because I'm conscious of time. I think this is my last slide. Um, this is, uh, you'll see a lot of these, these uh, catalysts, these milestone events um, are, are very similar. In fact, almost are, are identical to the to the key milestones that, that created value and surface value in, in, in stock price appreciation systematically over time, where as we kick, as we finalize the GMP, that's the guaranteed maximum price on our construction contracts. Um, as we uh, get our credit approved project debt in place, we get our early works in place, early works permit in place, our DFS, which is our, the, the final feasibility study on our revised a staged approach to the development of the asset uh, comes out in the middle of the year, finalize those EPC construction contracts, finalize the debt, get all the final permits in place, and we're aiming, aiming to kick off construction in Q2 2022. And hopefully, as different from Atlantic Gold, where we had a flat to down gold price, hopefully we've got a bit of a tailwind in, 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 in the current market that will continue um, while we continue to, to, uh, to, to deliver on these catalysts. Yeah, but that's all I was going to say. I hope that's been of interest and and uh, and, and uh, happy to take questions if there's time. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen. I, I guess the one question that um, we wanted to ask you is, what do you think's changed in the last few years in Atlant Atlantic Canada since you first started out with Atlantic Gold? Well, um, <laughs> I think there's a you touched on it in the, on the introduction. I think there's a realization that there is significant potential. Uh, for gold deposits, new gold deposits, and new gold deposits of scale. And Marathon are doing a great job in Newfoundland, Newfoundland for example. And, and I know a number of your presenters today are, are, are also delivering on this. The, the, the realization that um, the Atlantic provinces uh, have significant yet to be realized potential for, for value gold deposits and and uh, there's a rejuvenation of the industry. So with that comes some more challenges. There's some opposition um, uh, for development. I think they will always be there. So we've got to get better at managing the opposition and, 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 uh, and being respectful and, and, and dealing with their concerns um, and dealing with government, getting, getting government more up to speed with, with uh, this industry so that they can better respond to our needs. Great, well, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Um, 
congratulations on Atlantic Gold and, uh, and on Artemis as well. Look forward to following the story. And yeah, I, I think it's interesting what you said about the phased approach. We're seeing more and more um, mining companies follow that approach. Um, and yeah, your advice on capital raising too. Appreciate right. that. Appreciate it. Thanks for, for having me on your program.